Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with two newsmen, and both of them were familiar to the public for several generations. We're going to start out with the CBS reporter Bob Simon, who died recently at the age of 73. He's part of the tradition of notable CBS reporters that goes back to the Murrow generation. Bob Simon worked for six decades in the news, and here's Scott Pelley to talk about him. Bob Simon was among the most courageous and gifted reporters of our time, and he reminded us how good journalism can be. I'm from the Bronx, and in fact, it took a long time for... CBS would put me on the air because I had such a thick Bronx accent. We're going to pick up an American. The voice would become unmistakable. The perspective, indispensable. They don't know how many communists they're up against. They do know the enemy bunkers are less than 30 feet away. Bob Simon hurried to Southeast Asia in 1971 because, as he put it, history was being made. Civilian casualties were not announced, but it was another case of destroying a village in order to save it. Once you've covered a war, he said, there's nothing like it. So after he left Vietnam on one of the last helicopters out, he went back to war 34 times, asking questions that were straight, simple, devastating. Simon took risks, and the people who liked to control information hated him for it. But the audience was always the wiser. During the Gulf War in 1991, Simon was captured by Iraqi forces, along with producer Peter Bluff, and their crew, Roberto Alvarez and Juan Caldera. And we eventually wound up in the secret police headquarters called the Muhabarat and treated very badly. They were beaten, threatened with death, but released after 40 days. As you can see, we've lost a little weight, we've aged a little, but we're fine. Simon mastered something about television that others miss. The power is in the words, and with fine detail and sleight of hand, he delivered the truth you never saw coming. War was not his only adventure. He went into the wild, often, especially in these latter years. An animal is never duplicitous. It's very refreshing to go see them after you've spent a lot of time interviewing politicians. Someone once asked, after all he'd seen and done, what Simon wanted to be remembered for. Irony, he said. I'd like to be remembered for irony. Well, it turns out Bob Simon will be known for irony. He went to the war zones over 30 times. He was captured by the Iraqi secret police. He survived all those dangerous things. And he died as a passenger in a car accident in New York City. That's about as ironic as it comes. Well, we move on to another newsman, Stan Chambers, who died recently at the age of 91. Stan Chambers was from KTLA Los Angeles, and he was in the news reporting business for over eight decades. Keith Olbermann knew him personally and did a particularly moving tribute to Stan Chambers. For purposes of shorthand, Stan Chambers was the Vin Scully of local L.A. television news. For one thing, KTLA signed on on the 22nd of January, 1947, and Stan Chambers joined KTLA on December 1st, 1947. He worked there for 63 years. 17 months after he arrived, he more or less invented on the fly live television coverage of breaking news covering the tragedy of a little girl named Kathy Fiscus, who had fallen down an abandoned well. He was on the air for more than 27 hours. Forty years later, he and the news anchor man, my friend, the late Hal Fishman, just the two of them, provided live coverage of a light plane that had become entangled in high-tension wires. The plane never moved. Nothing happened. This went on for hours. Their reporting was somehow gripping. You could not turn away. Stan was low-key, subtle, straightforward, no frills, and brilliant. At various times, Stan Chambers was the news director at KTLA and the news anchorman and the reporter on the scene of the testing of the atomic bomb in the Nevada desert in 1952 and the reporter to whom the witness brought the tape of the police beating Rodney King. He stopped being the news director in 1970. He moved back down the ladder, back to being a reporter. Most people, understandably, would have left KTLA. Stan stayed for another 40 years. I once asked him why, and he laughed. I like the people, but that was only work. Stan Chambers was one of the five best people I've ever known. I first worked with him in 1985. I last saw him about two years ago. I never saw him angry, never saw him frustrated, never saw him, no matter the deadline, in so much of a rush that he didn't stop to ask how you were. And Stan did that, and Stan was that. Every day, for so long that when he turned 79, the station hired a new reporter who he knew very well, his grandson, Jamie. He got to work in television news alongside his own grandson. Of course, the odds against that are not what they might at first seem. Jamie was one of his grandchildren, one of his 38 grandchildren. 
Stan had 11 kids and lived to see eight great-grandkids. And then there were the rest of us. We only wished we had been related to him. Thank you, Stan. You know, I'm not the biggest Keith Olbermann fan in the world, but I will say this. In situations like this, when he's good, he's very, very good. Well, we're going to move on to another L.A. newsman now. He's an L.A. newsman of a different kind because he's not a real newsman. He just played one on TV, and he also played a voiceover artist, Gary Owens. He died recently at the age of 80. His voice was distinctive, and there were few guys on television or radio as talented and funny as Gary Owens. Take a listen to that familiar baritone on a syndicated radio show. Kapow! Thank you, Frank. Sinatra, of course, here on the Gary Owens Show and the music of your life. How little we know. Einstein probably knew as much as anyone, I suppose. Remember, knowledge is power. Sir Francis Bacon said it, and then Albert Einstein quoted him. Knowledge is power. Lyle F. Talcum, the famous philosopher, said knowledge is powder. But no one paid any attention. He was coming through an airport with talcum powder on his nose at the time. Also, the fact that Einstein was so smart, there is a rumor going around Hollywood right now, that Einstein was murdered by the mob because he knew too much. Well, that voice sounds familiar. Maybe you knew him as the Saturday morning cartoon character Roger Ramjet. Roger Ramjet, internationally famous good guy, devil may care, flying fool, and inventor of the Ramjet proton energy pill, which when taken as directed by a physician gives me the strength of 20 atom bombs for 20 seconds. Reporting, sir. Ramjet, take a look at this map. You mean this one? Yes, Roger. May I call you Roger? Roger. Splendid, Ramjet. Now, take a close look at the map. Thumping Thunderbird, sir. Does this mean that those arch fiends, the no goods, have a machine that's destroying our cities? No, it means those arch fiends, the no goods, have a machine that's destroying our tiny little light bulbs. Malfunctioning missiles, sir. That means every refrigerator in the country will be dark. No one will know what to eat. Exactly. And when the entire nation becomes weak from hunger, the no goods will take over. You might know him as the cheesier Saturday morning character, Space Ghost. The rays have been locked in. I can't reach my power bands. Very good, Cyclo Sentinels. Now bring Space Ghost to me. Must reach my power bands. There. Now, my force field will take care of them. Now to find Jan and Jace. Space Ghost calling Jan and Jace. But to most of us, Gary Owens is famous as the iconic newscaster in a fake newsroom with a crazy clock over his head, holding his hand to his ear on the television comedy classic Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Here's how he got the job. George Slaughter was a radio fan of mine. George was producing the Judy Garland show before Laugh-In. And I would get notes from him. I'd never met him before. So we went over to the Smokehouse restaurant for lunch one day. Artie Johnson, Digby Wolf, our first head writer, George, and myself. And we walked into the men's bathroom there. And because of the acoustic tile, I went like, My, the acoustics are good in here. And George says, Man, that's what I want you to do on the show. See, announcers always announced that way uh, when they were doing dance band remotes or sporting events because of the crowd noise behind them. Grellman gets the ball, oop, and it swishes through the hoops for two points. Many times announcers still do that. I never did that before, but I was imitating the old announcers because the acoustic tile made it bounce off the walls and gave you almost an echo effect. And that's how I was hired to be the announcer. And I'm laughing, he coined a classic comedy phrase. Beautiful downtown Burbank. I had created the phrase beautiful downtown Burbank from my radio show, mainly because of alliteration. Let's take a look at the weather forecast for magnificent Monrovia, romantic Reseda, and beautiful downtown Burbank. Steve Allen used to use beautiful downtown from the Krellman Hotel in beautiful downtown Chicago. Radio announcers, TV announcers always would say, from the beautiful blank blank hotel. Here in Dayton, Ohio, it's time for the Dayton game. Oh no, that would be another show. They would do this kind of a thing and by making beautiful downtown Burbank, now we would do shots of Burbank. <laughs> George Slaughter and Ed Friendly and Dan and Dick would always have the directors go out and have, and we had a special unit that just did uh, location shots. They were very, very good. <laughs> and they would make Burbank look as bad as it possibly could. Now, it's a very beautiful city. There's no doubt about it. The mayor gave me the key to the city for creating the phrase. Uh, and I could try at the middle of the night to get in there, but I still can't do it. A marvelous city, but within one week after Laugh-In had it on. 
They answered City Hall. Good morning, beautiful downtown Burbank, City Hall. Just because of that show, it became part of the vernacular. Finally, he talks about Laugh-In, which was groundbreaking in so many ways. The pacing of Laugh-In had never been done before. You never saw something with 10,000 miles per hour speed. You know, I would do maybe 20 jokes in one minute. I think Laugh-In retains its, uh, its powerful punch. It meant a lot to a lot of people. The 60s were a time of metamorphosis. Remember what Will Rogers said, I never metamorphosis I didn't like. But in the change that took place, it was part of their lives. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, we'd do everything from sock it to me to you bet your bippy. It became part of the vocabulary. It was well-loved. They had people on the show that were just wonderful, warm, silly, great people. It had a great impact. It really was an impact show. We're going to close tonight with Louis Jourdain, who died recently at the age of 93. Great-looking French actor, nice guy, brilliant, really a tough guy, too. He was in the French Resistance, and he's best known for one role as Gaston Lachey opposite Leslie Caron in the 1958 classic Gigi. Gaston! I received a note from Gigi. She said she wanted to see me. Of course. Of course. Won't you come in? No, my sister. My dear Mr. Lashai, what a pleasant surprise. And how is your enchanting father? He has diabetes. Uh, well, if one is in the sugar business and your attractive mother, well, I hope. Gaston, Gaston, I've been thinking I'd rather be miserable with you than without you. Yeah, he was great there, but the problem is he was typecast. He never got the offers. He did a great villain on Columbo. He did a great Count Dracula for the BBC. Come freely. Go safely. I am Count Dracula. Will you come in? And please, leave here some of the happiness you bring. He was a Bond villain, an octopusy. He didn't like his image as a French lover. He was married to the same woman for over 60 years. He read Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, and he liked to have fun in front of the camera. And here he is with Judy Garland on television. Every little breeze seems to whisper Louise. Birds in the trees seem to whisper Louise. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Louis Jordan. Wait a minute, Louis. Oh, what's just the cool it. Now, what's the matter? Cool Don't you like my number? Well, I like it, but it isn't just what we expected. We expected something a little more romantic. A little more romantic. That's right. It's always the same story. I can never do what I want. I can never do what I want. What do you want to do? I want to swing it, baby. <laughs> I want to swing it. I want to kind of... You know, kind of get cool, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, just go, baby, go. That's what I want. I want to go. Why, Louis, yeah, just go. Louis, if, if you swing, you'll destroy your image. Oh, I don't care about that. Oh, I don't care well, about that. It'll be that. anticlimactic. I don't Besides care about that, that, if you swing, we won't pay you. Oh, oh, oh. I care about that. Uh, 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 Judy, yes. I've changed my mind. Okay. Anything you want from me, you will have. You oh, yes. Have. All right. Ah, Judy. Judy. This is the moment I've been waiting for the duet. See, actually, I, I don't really sing, but singing with you is going to make me think I do. Oh, thank you, Louis. But we are going to sing Oh, together. that's wonderful. Wonderful. Now, uh, what are we going to sing? Are we going to sing something uh, special? Or... Oh, Louis. So... <laughs> How old is your son? My son? Yes. Well, one. Well, I have a little boy who is eight and a little girl who is 11, so I thought maybe we'd sing some songs for our children if that's all right. That's, oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Children would mind. Too much. If, if I asked you to sing Gigi, I'd love the way you do it. Judy, uh, Gigi is very nice, but there is another song. La, 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 la. Mr. Bluebird's on my shoulder. It's the truth. It's actual. Everything is satisfactory. Zippity do da. Zippity yay. My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine ahead in my way. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. And what else can we close with but the song that Judy Garland alluded to, one of the classics of the 20th century. My mom used to sing it to me when I was a little boy. Here's Louis Jourdain singing Gigi. This one's for you, Mom. Gigi, while you were trembling on the brink, was I out yonder somewhere blinking at a star? Oh, Gigi. Have I been standing up too close or back too far? When did your sparkle turn to fire and your warmth become desire? Oh, what miracle has made 
you the way you are.